Hello sir. Hi. How are you? I am good. Thank you so much. I got to know about you from Shubham's podcast. Acha. Okay, yeah. I was wondering. I just want to have a conversation with you. I did some research on you like you are a business consultant, right? And a coach and you have over 20 yeah. yeah. And you have over 25,000 hours of experience. That's just mind blowing. <laughs> well, that's what happens when you follow your passion. It's just that your communication skill is awesome. I just listened to your video. It's still on YouTube, and it's amazing, like how you engage people. Well, oh, so you should you should also take a look at my TEDx then. Yeah, yeah, I have listened I to that as well. Yeah, I have listened to that as well. Okay, no, definitely. By the way, who is whoever is still watching, all the links are in description. You can listen to his TEDx talk. His YouTube channel is also in the description box. You can click on that. Good. Thank you for your kind words, Jeff. Yeah. How are you? What's going on in your life nowadays? Well, life is good. Uh, I'm currently engaged in my research work at the amazing university in Pune, and uh, uh, soon to be picking up my doctorate degree. Wow! And uh, I am currently researching in the area of the volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world, and how businesses can flourish in this fractured world, in this world of unpredictabilities, in this world where everything is volatile. Things can change the moment you get up in the morning. So I am trying to make sense of this entire. I won't call it madness, but uh, as researchers, we call it the phenomena. And the phenomena, by definition, is any remarkable event that could happen. in your life if it could happen on the planet it could happen outside the planet so my quest is to study remarkable events now so i study phenomena this research that assumes nearly 60 to 70% of my time now and uh, i apply this research in the area of business so a lot of organizations do tend to take my research advisory and uh, as uh, it is required that all researchers should work for the community benefit so i keep publishing my research on linkedin though i do publish my research in various journals also but not many people have accesses to journals so i am doing a lot of uh, publications on linkedin so that's what consumes my time now truly amazing sir and how do you research about this like your topic what are the factors that you keep in mind while researching on this stuff one is whenever you're pursuing your formal research you your university uh, clears a title for you so the research is constrained as far as the title is concerned but there are various methods that you can use i mean uh, one requirement is massive amount of literature review so there are various scholars or all, all over the world who would have published a lot of research authentic literature so i do a lot of literature reviews i have a massive library of my own uh i keep reading books there and i buy books that i've realized in my life is that when you buy you read so that's what i do apart from that there are a lot of uh, primary research which are my corporate projects so a lot of people come to me with very very complex problems we also tend to call them wicked problems so we get into those problems and uh, uh, we create business models and frameworks to solve those models mm-hmm. uh then when i do my executive coaching also a lot of data comes from there then i have a back end research team with me who are a set of people who work in my company So then we try and make sense of all the data. So we're currently crunching around one hundred thousand keywords in the area of the way the world is today, and uh, we are attempting to create a mathematical model out of it. So it's a new theory. It's a new. It's it's an invention, if you may call. Uh, so this research is consuming a lot of my time. Amazing, sir. And according to research, what are the key factors that you think like? Nowadays, AI is really in trend, right? So there is a lot of fear around it. What are your views on that? My views are very clear as a researcher. I mean, one of the areas that's coming very strong in my research is any organization that has to be resilient in today's world, or any entrepreneur who wants to create a, a startup, uh, which has to withstand the turbulence. Artificial intelligence technology is going to play a very very crucial role now the whole point is if your cognitive abilities that means if your brain is functioning ahead of the technology you're on so what am i trying to say i'm trying to say that as long as you don't pick up a standard job which can be replaced by technology you're good but if you decide to pick up a job or you decide to start operating an entrepreneurship venture 
which can be so standardized and it may not be anything that could be very breakthrough in its own nature, then certainly one fine morning you will find uh, uh, artificial intelligence taking over. But there are certain areas where certainly artificial intelligence will never be able to take over. And when I say never, never. One is the area of design. You know, so I'm a design thinking professional. I teach design thinking. I structure a lot of models around design thinking. Now, what happens is when you pick up any problem that is very complex and it requires a very, very novel solution, that artificial intelligence cannot do. Mm -hmm. Okay, because what does artificial intelligence feed on? It feeds on existing data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whatever you have done in the digital world, artificial intelligence captures the data and then makes sense out of it. So it is an intelligent system. One can't say it's a dumb system. But ultimately, it can only create theories, models, or maybe sequence of sentences, which are logically put together, which is based on data that is already existing. Mm -hmm. But if you are able to create new data, for instance, in my research, artificial intelligence fails completely. It, it just gives up. It says, I'm sorry, I cannot help you in this area. And I was doing this experiment where I said, okay, let's test artificial intelligence because in my area of work, AI is coming big time. So the research that I'm conducting and those 100,000 keywords that we pulled out in the primary research, we attempted to make some meaning out of it using artificial intelligence. And AI could not even construct a statement or a sentence out of it. It, the system just halted. And that's where my conviction comes from. So if you are designing, if you are conducting new experiments, if you are coming up with products which have not yet been created, but ultimately what will happen is once you have created something and it has been put to use and the artificial intelligence then captures the data on the cloud, then your product, your process, your system, your intelligence, your knowledge will be taken over by mm -hmm. the system artificial intelligence for sure. So the only way out is in the new world that we will live in, as long as we are ahead of artificial intelligence, we are good. So jobs will not go for people who are ahead of artificial intelligence. But jobs of people will certainly be at stake if you are operating standard operating procedures. Definitely. You said this in your TED talk, we die with fresh brains. That has stick with me. I do. Because run away from complex problems. And that has stick with me till now. And like, we have to do something. We have to constantly learn. We have to hustle, right? You have to solve wicked problems. The more wicked the problem, the more the money. Look, understand. I mean, you're going to be, your, your podcast is going to be uh, possibly heard by, watched by a certain set of people who would aspire to do something inspiring in life. Definitely. And if that's what they want to do, the only way out is your money that you make in life is completely, it's directly proportional to the complexity of the problem you solve. Now, don't go for a big problem right away. Start working on small, solved, small, small problems, build the intelligence, and then ultimately bridge it so that you are going to solve a very, very complex project. I mean, if I have to look at my journey as an entrepreneur, I started off 22 years ago in my entrepreneurship journey after my corporate life, where I said, let me start off with baby steps. Mm -hmm. But as the baby steps, we build so much of knowledge. We build so much of knowledge that today we are able to pick up complex problems that many of the consulting companies don't even want to touch. Look, I always tell my clients, my work starts when everybody says we can't solve this problem. And that's only possible when you constantly take baby steps and you're constantly generating a lot of knowledge. What are your views on money? Like nowadays, the teenage, right? They are constantly fed that you have to make money. They have, and they are showing reels of people with uh, supercars and all that. They can be toxic to some people as well. Like they can go into wrong direction. So what are our views on that? Like what should be the relationship of teenagers or in general, people with money. There is no problem with money. Okay, life without money, you can't enjoy it. So if somebody is telling you that you feed your passion with an empty stomach, doesn't work. Right? Should you make a lot of money? Yes, you should. Making money is not a problem. You should. You know, because ultimately, if you want to build a great empire, if you want to build a great organization, it must sustain itself. So money is very important. And if you're at work, with the current trends in terms of the professions, uh, the jobs that people pick up, 
there's no guarantee how long you'll be on the job. One fine morning you will come and somebody will tell you, okay, thank you very much, we don't need you anymore. So therefore, you must have enough money in your pockets to withstand the long winters, as we keep saying as researchers. Now, one is money has to be earned ethically. Now, as long as you're earning money ethically, it's fine. And now, how do you earn money ethically? The only way to earn money ethically, and that to tons of money ethically, is back it up with knowledge. So I keep saying this, Saraswati and Lakshmi go together. Saraswati is the elder sister, Lakshmi is the younger sister. First, you go after Saraswati. And once Saraswati aligns with you, Lakshmi has to align with you. So if you're in college, take your education very seriously. Because if you don't take it seriously, then you will have to compromise on work ethics to make money. And the moment you compromise on work ethics to make money, the law of karma is going to take over, whether you believe it or you don't believe it. And one day, the truth has the uncanny habit of surfacing. And the moment the truth surfaces and any unethical act has been conducted, or there's a compromise in work ethics, you're going to lose your job. Because if you really ask me, most of the companies today are aligning to ethical norms. Even a lot of brands which did not practice ethics are today aligning to ethics. Because they know that they cannot sustain the current volatility in the market unless the corporate governance systems are intact. Mm -hmm. Plus, the government regulations and technology also is ensuring that the governance structures uh, are followed. Therefore, there's no way out. So, the, I think the only way by which you can really go, go rich is to understand there's nothing wrong in being rich. But to become rich, knowledge and ethics have to go together. As long as you're doing that, there's no problem. You said that uh, about Saraswati and Lakshmi thing in a TED talk as well. And yeah. uh, if one finds a passion, first of all, how one should find a passion? Because there are many streams and right and many things to choose from. And other than that, how when one has found the passion, how should he or she be consistent in it? Like he should be regularly hustling, gaining knowledge about that. Interesting. Let me share the story of passion. How do you discover your passion? Uh, a lot of times people say it's very difficult to discover your passion. And I, my answer to them always is, well, then you haven't spent time with yourself. You're possibly spending too much time with people around you. Now, how do you find your passion? Sit down in a quiet corner. You don't know for how many days you might have to repeat it. And you don't have to sit down in a quiet corner for hours together. You may just want to spend 5-7 minutes a day and ask yourself this question. What is it that I would do even if I am asked to get up in the middle of the night and I would do it for free? Which primarily means something that nourishes my soul, something that I am very fond of, and I could even do it for free. Mm -hmm. And I can do it for free for a lifetime. I am not suggesting you do it for free. But when you say this, that what is it that I do, that I would want to do, even if I am woken up in the middle of the night and it's something that is very joyful for me you have come very close to your passion you haven't discovered your passion as yet for instance in my case when I got absolutely sick of my corporate life I asked myself this question what is it that I would want to really do if I have no liabilities in life and again, I asked myself this question, what is it that even I would love to do if I'm dead tired and in the middle of the night somebody would ask me to do it? And the answer that came to me is, I would certainly want to help people win. And when I tracked back my entire career in corporate life, which was around 12 years, I found that I was either working with startups or I was working on turnaround operations. And my whole life was all about helping organizations win and helping people win. And once that endorsement came, I picked up that journey. Now, what do you do with your passion? Passion is a, is a process of experimentation. If somebody were to tell you that I've found my passion and for the rest of the life I'm going to pursue it, it doesn't work like that. You start with an idea which is close to your passion. And then as you start executing that idea, you start discovering a journey which is kind of endless and your passion keeps evolving. But one has to distinguish between what is it that you like and what is your passion. Yeah. Like is 10,000 things that you would do. But passion is that one thing that you would do 
even if those other 10,000 things are not available in your life. <laughs> you know, you live for it. So like in, in Zen, I'm a practitioner of Zen. In Zen, we keep saying that you must desire something as though your head is held under water and you're desperate to breathe. And if that desperation is there, that's your passion. And then once you take on to the journey of passion, you got to monetize your passion. So once you discover your passion, I mean, you can even pick up a corporate job because there are jobs available which allow you to pursue your passion. But should you realize that those jobs are not there or should you have an entrepreneurial streak within you, take the passion, go out into the market, talk to people who are not fond of you because they're not going to tell you the truth because they love you and they don't want to offend you. Talk to people who are very upfront, who are experts. Place your passion in front of them. See what's going to work, what's not going to work. And then based on whatever influences come from there, now start shaping your idea to monetize it. And then once you take on to the journey of monetization, keep talking to people. Mm -hmm. And keep asking them, what is it that I can do more in this area? And if you enjoy doing it, do it. If you don't enjoy doing it, don't do it. Mm -hmm. And then you realize over years as you practice your passion, the passion keeps growing, the passion keeps evolving, and the passion keeps taking you to very, very new places. Certain places, certain areas and zones of life which you never thought you would get into. For instance, I never thought I would get into research. But my passion moved me into the space of research. Correct? So that's what passion is. Yeah. As then. <laughs> Once you get out of your passion, there's no concept of work-life balance. <laughs> Once you get out of your passion, you know, for instance, my day is 16 hours of work because it's a holiday. Right? If you're pursuing your passion, then obviously what you're doing, you're enjoying to do it, right? Definitely. That means it's your holiday. And if your profession becomes your holiday, that means you're absolutely aligned to your passion. So where is the question of work-life balance? Where is the question of not going overboard? You know, these questions just vanish. In my case, like, I like doing YouTube. I like talking to people. Even if someone, like, asks me to wake up at night, I will do that. Everything that you say, na, it is relating with me so much that this conversation I really enjoy. So I, I, I said yes to you because when you said you want to do a podcast with me and you said, I want to do it today. And I said, now this guy is passionate about it because he doesn't have time in life. If you would have said one month later, two weeks later, I would have said, no, thank you. Because that's not your passion. That's just the time pass you're indulging in. Mm -hmm. Right. Now that you're taking on to it, your passion, what is very important is to design an ecosystem that allows your passion to flourish. A lot of people, whether they're entrepreneurs or they're professionals, they do have passions, but they do not create an ecosystem which can make their passion successful. So you're a YouTuber. Until and unless you create an ecosystem of technology around you, people mm -hmm. around you, you're not going to be successful. So calibrate what is it that is required in your ecosystem and consciously nourish it. Now, there are three kinds of people which I keep saying on this planet. One, who know what their passion is, but decide not to pursue it because they want to go after their financial goals. Mm -hmm. Second set of people who don't know their passion at all, which is fine. Where is it written that everybody needs to be passionate? No, you can have a chilled out life here and you can still be doing good. There's no problem. Then the third set of people who know what their passion is and decide to stick to it. The third set of people are rare. Because they know that they're going to have cash burns. They know that the journey is not going to be a very easy one because the passion is unique in its own way. Right. It's something that others cannot do because the universe has designed you in a way which fits you in terms of the passion. So the talents that you have, whatever you do, it comes naturally to you, which cannot come. So no, nobody can copy your passion and you can't copy someone's passion. Therefore, it becomes very important that once you realize that, create an ecosystem. I think what I have done in my work is I constantly get up in the morning and when I go out for my morning walk, I call my morning walk my idea walk. 
mm-hmm. right so i go and i walk for 5 and 1/2 kilometers every day and the reason i walk for 5 and 1/2 kilometers is primarily because that's when a kind of a startup idea comes to me though my business is 22 years old every day when i go for a walk i get a startup idea something else that i should do in my work and then i come back and i immediately implement it and that's what takes your passion to the next orbit so every day you got to shift orbit of your passion so that's how it works let's talk about ethics and morality right because it is a really important concept and yes i feel that it is lacking in youth somewhere like not in all but while watching all this content there are different kinds of content right this can affect someone's mentality greatly and sometimes i even feel that i lack empathy i like some ethics i don't know but it's a feeling that i constantly get that i have to do something what is ethical what is not what i have used on that okay so there's something called as conscience within us mm-hmm. now what is this conscience it's a small little voice within us which tells us whether we're doing something correct or incorrect now when we stop listening to this voice then the voice says okay thank you very much i'm not going to talk to you anymore okay and when some reversal happens because of the effect of unethical practice then the conscious comes and says i told you right but if you start listening to this small voice the little voice within you it grows now let's understand this there are ethical dilemmas that we come up with in life always now what is an ethical dilemma there is a situation and i have possibly two or three options right and i cannot differentiate which is it that is an ethical option mm-hmm. it could be morally right you know but it may be ethically wrong mm-hmm. but so and it is ethical morals are based on the social systems mm-hmm. the society decides what is moral and immoral mm-hmm. for instance certain countries to eat human flesh is completely moral but in the majority of the countries you eating human flesh is not moral can it mm-hmm. in certain if to look at it in the past in india there were certain practices which were moral then but they're not moral today yeah because the society is going to change but ethics are driven by principles and the principle is your cause and effect the karma mm-hmm. so there is this conscience in within us which everybody is born with and the conscience tells you should you do it should you not do it the choice is yours morality is defined <laughs> yeah there is a book there is a ritual there is a traditional structure law is a different dimension law will come up with its own concepts they are right. right and they could be beyond ethics they could even be beyond morality <laughs> now therefore if you want to be successful in life what should you adhere to you must adhere to your ethics now it can't be that your ethics and my ethics are different why because ultimately conscience is driven by the law of cause and effect and the conscience is driven by the law of cause and effect that little voice tells us this is correct this is incorrect because it's about all so if one is deciding to become successful in life learn to listen to that inner voice and the more you listen to the inner voice the more it is going to help you so in a ethical dilemma what should you do very simple i mean i keep telling this every time i take an ethical workshop if there is something that you would want to hide from your mother it must certainly be wrong you may be able to share it with your best friend this is but you certainly would not be able to share it with some very pure relationship in your life unless and until you even corrupted that relationship then there is no argument then there is no debate because there is no help but if you feel like hiding something you're certainly doing something wrong <laughs> but if you're not saying something and you say i will say it after a year i will inform after the year, it's fair because you may not want to create turbulence in the mind of the other person so you're doing something right but for some reason you're not sharing it which is fine but if you decide not to share it at all and you want to keep it as a dark secret you're certainly doing something wrong at life do you read books while he wrote so books massive library of my own i must have at least 
400 odd books in my library of my own and uh, i'm very very particular about my reading habits uh i do a lot of online courses mm-hmm. uh if you see my linkedin profile currently i'm operating at the 40th certification so massive investments in books lot of time i spend in reading i audit my day every day what is it where is it that i have spent time which i could have used for something better and i sincerely get up in the next day morning and resolve that i'm not going to uh use that habit again to waste that time but sometimes habits are very uh wired and it becomes mm-hmm. difficult again i do the audit there you go uh, you didn't go by what you said the discipline was lacking so as long as you're honest with yourself you're able to break the habit so if i have let's say if i'm traveling and i'm on a flight or i'm in a train i love to travel by trains you know so because trains give me that extra time where i can actually be with my books i can pick up a book i can read it so i give a choice between a flight and a train i would take a train but certainly not a train which could be 24 hours or 18 hours because then you know it, it yeah. does become a little thing. but for instance i live in pune so pune bombay you know i can definitely take my car and go but i don't do that you know and i and i drive a sports car but i don't do that what i tend to do is i take the vande bharat a very peaceful train uh, sit in the compartment and you're all by yourself and you book so you got good 3 3 and a half hours to read up yeah if i'm in a hotel then evening i'm alone so if i'm alone in the evening beyond 5 o'clock and i i do practice consciously that once i finish my work and i'm uh, traveling post 6 o'clock in the hotel room i don't meet anybody i tend to pick up my book and i start reading that's great i recently also started reading before 2023 and around that time i never read book i never even like even a single page on my own aside from textbooks but now i started reading a book that is called 48 laws of power and yeah it is slowly wiring me in such a like every morning i set aside 20 30 minutes and beside my lamp on my being back high read that book and that is really changing me i can see the uh, different habits that are changing within me every day and yes everyone who is watching i really hope that you also start reading book if you are not reading it and yeah this can change you in many ways you can never imagine certainly and nobody writes a bad book ever so any yeah. book that you pick up is going to be good can you please specify that how can <laughs> a bad book will never sell yeah uh yeah number one number two even if the book is written by an agenda or with an agenda you get a different perspective to that topic so that's why i keep saying no book is bad it gives you different perspectives of life it helps you to challenge a lot of your own assumptions and that's the beauty what are your final views on for the audience advice you want to give to the audience that will stick with them and help them grow in some way or another yeah i think we are all living in the best times as far as india is concerned okay there was never a era in the history which was so profound as it is today therefore in the scientific community we keep saying that the new generation they have unseen opportunities uh those opportunities did not exist before but only an opportunity is meaningless unless you build your own capabilities unless you design an ecosystem you can't capitalize on the opportunity education is very important constantly upgrading your skill sets is extremely important and you know one thing that i have realized in my research is all the people who done exceedingly well for themselves have had a sense of purpose they wanted to contribute to the humanity or to any living organism for sure in a direct way or an indirect way. it could be pets animals it could be anything decide what your sense of purpose is acquire all the capabilities and competencies which allow you to give velocity to your sense of purpose build design an ecosystem that nourishes your sense of purpose and now once you're on the track of sense of purpose don't worry you'll have your own highs and lows 
but after every low you will hit a new high you have to fall in love with problems today when you fall in love with problems your sense of purpose will definitely flourish and i think my last view point i'm a very staunch practitioner of the jungian philosophy carl jung was an amazing guy he was a swiss swiss psychiatrist you must allow your personality to express itself completely and the only way that can happen is when you have a sense of purpose that's unique to you which is also part of your passion but a passion converted to improving the quality of humanity becomes a sense of purpose you're done you can never fail and i think that's going to be my message for everybody thank you so much for coming i really appreciate it i really appreciate the time you have spent with me thank you thank you all right see you see you sir bye